Okay, so last time we were talking about Louisiana Purchase, we talked about uh, Lewis and Clark looking for that expedition and uh, West Water Passage to the Pacific Ocean. And we talked about Sacagawea leading them across, and we talked about York, the very interesting slave best friend guy that they had. Uh, and so, yeah, we talked about all of that. So Jefferson did get reelected in 1804, and if you notice here, when he ran against Charles Pinckney, uh, he defeated him pretty handily. So this was not a close election by any means. Uh, Jefferson wins 162 to 14. So it's like, <laughs> nice try, Pinckney. But uh, you didn't win that one. Not even close. But again, is it difficult for the Federalists to win an election now? Because is Jefferson standing for some of the principles of the Federalists? Yeah. So I mean, like, why vote for Pinckney? when Jefferson is standing up for the very same things that the Federalists used to stand for. There's no point in voting for a Federalist because Jefferson is a party for everyone. So the Federalists try and they don't win, so you know, that's how that goes. Cool so far? Wonderful. Wait. Huh? I still have his name. Who? Pinckney? Yeah. That's okay. You don't really have to know him. Ah, uh, we just did that. So this brings us to Aaron Burr. So Aaron Burr. In the second election of Thomas Jefferson, he drops Aaron Burr as vice president. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the Aaron Burr saga, and we're gonna talk about these in conspiracies. Let's talk about conspiracy number one, because Aaron Burr is a crazy individual. Conspiracy number one. So here's what happened. Aaron Burr was dropped as Jefferson's vice president because Jefferson didn't trust him anymore. Huh? That's, uh, well, we'll talk about it, or I'm getting into it. Uh, but what happened was that because he was dropped, that's part of the conspiracy, because Aaron Burr was dropped by uh, Jefferson in his administration, he got mad. He said, oh, Jefferson, he screwed me over. And so instead, what he decides to do is to join with some extreme New England Federalists. Remember, folks, he's a Republican. And he decides to join up with some extreme New England Federalists. And they secretly plan to have the New England states secede. What does it mean to secede? What does secede mean? Not to take over. To break away. So pretty much the New England Federalists, some of them were so extreme and angry at Thomas Jefferson as president, and Aaron Burr was so upset about him being kicked out that he said, you know what we should do? We should just secede, break away from the US, and make our own country. And so that's what he threatened to do, just to break off and make their own country. Sounds a lot like some people in our current government today, right? They hate the president so much that they're willing to break apart the country. Well, Alexander Hamilton finds out about this plot. And what do you expect him to do? No. You expect him to be excited about it, right? But he's not. Because you have to understand, Alexander Hamilton might be a Federalist, but he's also a true American. Him and Jefferson may not agree on things, but do they both want what's best for America? Yeah. yeah, they both really love America. They both did what they thought was best for America. So when Hamilton finds out about the secret plan to secede, Hamilton uh, tells, I guess the best way to put it, Hamilton tells on Burr, and the plan is foiled, or the plan is spoiled, or the plan is destroyed, or the plan is broken up. I don't know the best way to explain this right now. But uh, Hamilton uncovers the plan and Aaron Burr is forced to first flee. But before he does that, he challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel. And in that duel, Aaron Burr kills Alexander Hamilton in a duel. So because Hamilton uncovers the secret plan or the secret secession plan, Aaron Burr, so upset 
challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel and kills him. And that's the end of Alexander Hamilton. Killed in a duel by Aaron Burr. Now here's the thing, folks. Uh, Alexander Hamilton may not have ever been president, and you may not have liked some of his policies, but was he, like, a true American? Yeah. Very much, uh, as much as Jefferson, Adams, Washington, he was a very important founding father that tried to do what was best for the country, right? Mm -hmm. And he was killed by Aaron Burr. Good? Okay, not good. Okay, moving on. Second conspiracy is that he tried to get Louisiana territory to secede, but he gets found out, so he runs away to Europe. And the third conspiracy is that he tries to get England and France to jointly invade the U.S., but that fails. So ultimately, Thomas Jefferson, not Thomas Jefferson, not Alexander Burr. Hamilton. Oh, Aaron Burr. Aaron, his name's right there, too. Uh, Aaron Burr, uh, he decides to come back to America, and he dies as a lawyer and never having been punished for his crimes. So that's the Aaron Burr saga. Good so far? Wonderful. Uh, this brings us to neutrality in the Napoleonic Wars. So there's a war going on between England and France, and what role does Jefferson want America to play in this war? Neutrality. neutrality. Yeah. Wonderful. And so we want to remain neutral, which means who are we as a country trading with if we're neutral? If both these countries are warring with each other and we're neutral, who do we think we have the right to trade with? Well, ourselves, yeah, but we also have the right to trade with both of them, right? Because am I at war with England? No. Am I as America at war with France? No. no, so I should reasonably be able to trade with both people, right? And isn't it in my interest, in the interest of my economy to trade with both? Because that helps my economy. But does England like the fact that we're trading with France? No. And does France like the fact that we're trading with England? No. no. So what they decide to do is that both countries pass their own laws, the British pass the orders in council, and the French pass the continental system, and pretty much what both these laws do is that they impress any American sailors trading with their enemy. So any Americans trading with France, what's gonna happen? What are the British gonna do? The British are, are going to impress those sailors. And any sailors trying to imp, uh, trade with the British are going to be impressed by who? The French. So both impressed. Both the French and the British impressed American sailors. If I was an American sailor trying to trade with the British, the French would impress me. If I was a American sailor trying to trade with the French, the British would impress me. Questions? Questions? It's called the Orders in Council. The British passed a law called the Orders in Council, and the French passed the Continental System. And both were elements of impressment. You try to trade with my enemy, I will impress your army or impress your sailors. Because they didn't want us trading with their enemy. Now, did America think that was fair? No. Like, why are you impressing our sailors? We're still trading with you. I don't see why we can't trade with the enemy. We're neutral. And if you're neutral, should you be allowed to trade with everyone? So naturally, America was upset because was England or France recognizing our neutrality? No, they were not. And we were so upset about this that we said, fine. And we're going to skip that. If you are not going to recognize our neutrality, then we're going to go ahead and embargo you. So in 1807, Thomas Jefferson passed the Embargo Act of 1807. So Thomas Jefferson, in response to the impressment of American sailors, passes the Embargo Act of 1807. And what happens with the Embargo Act of 1807 is that it bans all trade with Europe. It bans all trade with Europe. That's what an embargo does. It bans all trade with Europe. Like if we had an embargo on Cuba, what would we not be allowed to do? Trade with Cuba. What if we had an embargo with North Korea, which we do? What are we not allowed to do? Trade with North Korea. Well, we said, you know what, Europe, 
You're not taking us seriously. We're supposed to be neutral and you're not recognizing it. So we're going to embargo you, which means we're not going to trade with you. And they said the embargo would continue or the whole point was to force Europe to recognize what? Neutrality. America's neutrality. That was the whole point of this, to force Europe to recognize American neutrality. We're neutral. You're supposed to recognize that. So if you're not going to do that, then guess what? We're not going to trade with you until you recognize our neutrality. Now, is that maybe an effective way to get people to do what we want? Yeah. Sure. But here's the problem. Jefferson, and here's the best way to put it, overestimated Europe's reliance on American trade. Jefferson overestimated Europe's alliance, Europe's reliance on American trade. We thought that they needed us more than we needed them. Does that make sense? Yeah. You need us. So if we embargo you, oh, you'll be sorry. And then, of course, they're going to have to recognize a neutrality because their economies are going to be destroyed by our embargo. But folks, it's 1807. How long has America actually been around? For like 30 years or something, right? And so has Europe been trading long before America has existed? So do they really need us? Like, it'll be annoying if uh, we don't trade with them, but they don't actually need us. But do we need them? Yes. So we overestimated Europe's reliance on American trade. And so here's the impact, folks, of the Embargo Act. The impact of the Embargo Act is the following. It destroyed the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, folks, came to a complete halt. It just stopped. Because, folks, who does America trade with? Europe. Europe. Who else? Yeah, think about that for a second. That's, <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, we kind of trade with Africa. Yeah, we kind of trade with the Spanish and you know other colonies in Latin America. But the vast majority of our trade, I would say like 90 or 80% of our trade goes where? Europe. And now we said, ha ha, we've embargoed you, so you're gonna suffer. No, 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 no. Maybe 50% of their trade relies on us, but 80% of our trade relies on them. And because of that, the U.S. economy was devastated. We had no one to trade with. And so the New England states, especially the New England economy and New England trade, suffered dramatically. New England trade began to suffer as a result. There were millions unemployed. So again, New England trade suffered. Because what does New England mostly do? What is their job? Like New England states, what do they do mostly? They trade, they ship all the goods from America, right? They're the shipbuilders, they're, they're, they're the traders. Because what do the Southern and Western states do? They're farmers. They farm and then the New England states have to ship it. So New England states, their trade is just devastated. Millions are unemployed and then farmers are unable to sell their crops. Is this good for the US economy? No, not at all. Everyone hated this so much that, in fact, they began to call this uh, embargo, or they criticized the uh, embargo as the oh, grab me. They called it oh, grab me. And so you see this political cartoon. Here's this guy that's trying to trade with this British ship. And what's stopping him? this giant turtle called Oh Grab Me. And this is supposed to be Jefferson laughing, like, ha ha ha, look how that turtle snicks him. Like, look, it's stopping him from trading because it's stopping these Americans from trying to trade with the British to fix their economy. What's Oh Grab Me? Oh, grab. Hey, grab. No, 
know. It's a uh, embargo spelled backwards. Wow. Oh. Because they didn't want to openly criticize the uh, embargo act, so they were subtle. And they spelled it backwards instead. I'm like, oh, there's not the embargo. It's a oh, grab me. It's different. Uh, but no, they openly criticized it, and they used the snapping turtle called Oh Grab Me to criticize the Embargo Act. And they said, it's ruining the economy, it's terrible, and were a lot of people angry at Jefferson for it. A lot of people were angry at Jefferson for it. Um, eventually, we're going to have to repeal it, because did it work? No. Was this successful? No. no. The Embargo Act was a failure. I mean, make sure you note that, but the Embargo Act was a failure and we're gonna be forced to repeal it. And again, the Embargo Act was a failure and we're gonna be forced to repeal it because it did not work at all. Uh, so the last thing you should note though is because of the Embargo Act, it revived which group? The Federalists. It revived the Federalist Party. Why does this revive the Federalist Party? What can they now do? Not take over, but why are they revived? I think that's a more important question. Because Jefferson fell. Because Jefferson screwed up. Now do they, now do they have something to complain about? Yeah. Aha, you see? You see, this is what we were talking about. Jefferson doesn't know how to manage the economy. So if you want someone to manage this economy well, you got to vote uh, Federalist. So they start coming back to power because were the New England states really upset about this? And now, it's, oh, Jefferson's the bad one. I told you these Republicans don't know what they're doing. And so now the Federalists start slowly coming back to power. Make sense? Yes. OK. So Jefferson eventually uh, steps down at the end of 1808. Uh, why? Because of the, not because, no, a two-term tradition. Is there, a, is there a limit? No. No, it's a tradition. Is it a law? No. No, it's a tradition. It's a precedent. So he steps down because who did step down also? George. Washington stepped down, and I'm not better than George Washington. Also, he was kind of unpopular because of the Embargo Act, so he was like, mm, I think now's about time to leave. Uh, so he steps down after two terms, and one nice thing you should know also, and then we'll work on this chart together in just a minute, is that after he left uh, in 1812, he rekindled his relationship with John Adams. Remember how they stopped being friends for a really long time? Eventually, in 1812, they started writing letters to each other again, and they became friends again. They started writing letters about like philosophy and like you know how their lives are going, and they were just impressed with this. You know, they're like all constantly being very um, positive and uh, very complimentary towards each other. And eventually, in 1826, folks, on the 50th anniversary of the United States, on July 4th. 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence when America was born, they both died on the same day. Both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, both writers of the Declaration of Independence, who were both president and best friends for a while, had the relationship kind of distance themselves because of political parties, and then finally you know, mended their friendship, both died on the same day on the 50th anniversary of the United States on July 4th, 1776. Jefferson was in Virginia and Monticello. Adams was in Massachusetts and Braintree. And Adams was 90 at the time. Uh, Jefferson was 82. And when Adams died, he was on his deathbed. The last words before he died is, Jefferson still survives. And those were his last words. And then he died. Which means the last thing that Jeff Adams was thinking about was his friend, Thomas Jefferson. Unfortunately, he was wrong because Jefferson had died five hours earlier. But that's just like, oh, like magical friendship. Like they both died on the same day and they were like not friends for a while, but they were the best of friends who fought for the country together. And then they lost their way, but they came back. And then they died on the same day on July 4th of the 50th anniversary. I mean, that's just poetic. That's just like, whoa. Gives you like it just like hits you in the feels, you know? Like you just, <laughs> just get it. Yes. Old age. I mean one's eighty two and one's ninety. So they died from boxing. No, they just died of old age. So. 
Of old age? Yes, they both died of old age. Remember guys, what's the life expectancy at this time? It's like, it's like 70. So 82 and 90 is pretty good. Life expectancy in the South early back was like 60. Jefferson lived to 82. They both lived 20 years longer than the basic life expectancy. So they're, they're doing pretty well. So, you know, there's that. Is it because they're rich? I mean, that helps, you know, when you eat. Food is good. Yes. What? Uh, Adams is buried in Braintree, Massachusetts, in his home, I think. And I believe Jefferson is buried in Monticello, where his home is. I'm not 100% sure on that, though, because different presidents are buried in different places. So I don't know if that's true, but I think that's where they're buried. You can look it up online. I don't know. Yes. George Washington died of pneumonia. He went out riding on a horse one day, and he forgot to wear a jacket. And, so, and he was kind of old at the time. And he rode a jacket, uh, and it was snowing. I mean, he didn't ride a jacket, and it was snowing. So he rode on his horse, because he liked riding his horse. And then he rode out one day, and it was snowing, and he caught a cold, and he died of pneumonia. Huh? He was pretty old also. I mean, he wasn't, like, young. He was, like, 70, probably. And again, like, you know, bullets couldn't kill him, but pneumonia? Oh. <laughs> pneumonia. That's the worst. Bullets? Whatever. Pneumonia? Ooh. George Washington's Achilles heel. Bacteria. Who would have thought? Anyway, your task in the next eight minutes, please write down what Jefferson did during his administration. Political, economic, social, and international. Explain why Jefferson was successful. And then failures and successes, folks. Do both. What, is, what happened during his administration? Eight minutes, go. Get to work. For example, Louisiana Purchase could be both economic and social and international, and I, I want you guys to be able to see that. Because if you had an essay like, oh, explain the economic successes of Jefferson, you should still be able to talk about Louisiana Purchase. Okay, so make sure that if it fits in multiple columns, write about that.
folks. So again, make sure you guys are filling out political, economic, social, and international. And again, they can't fit in multiple categories. All right, folks, let's go over this list real quick. Uh, just raise your hand. What are some of the things that we can put in for the political column? So what are some political things that we can talk about? Evelyn. Judicial review, Judicial review definitely. Yeah. What else can we talk about that Jefferson did? Leslie. Say what, Ian? That wait. So you're saying say that one more. So what? Do you, what do you want me to write down? Oh, he understood both of them. Uh, so I would say that we are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. I think that's the best way. We are all Federalists and Republicans. What else can we write down? Abel. Pragmatic. Pragmatic. Sure. Definitely. 
What else can we write down about him that would be considered political? What are some other political things? What do you guys write down, folks? Raise your hand. Let me call on you. Yeah, Brian. Part of the Alien Sedition Act. Uh, sorry, what? Pardon. pardon the Alien and Sedition Acts or pardon those arrested. So pardoned people with the Alien and Sedition Acts. What else, folks? Is it just Abel in this class? No. Adriana. Revolution of 1800, definitely. There's a lot of stuff there. Abel, what else? Yeah, he kept the bus. It could be economic, too. Anything else that he did? Come on, folks. You have notes in front of you, I imagine. Eva. Huh? So the election of 1800, sure. Adriana. Which one? Mosquito, Mosquito fleet. Yeah, there's the military. That's political. Could be political. Mosquito fleet. Sure. What else? Uh, Draven. Election of 1804. Election of 1804. Yeah, you can talk about how he uh, spanked Pinckney. Anything else, Brian? Created a naturalization process. Naturalization process. Yeah, definitely. During the Alien Sedition Act's uh, end of that. Uh, Abel. Which one? Uh, excessive tax. Excise. Excise. He took away the whiskey tax, so he repealed the whiskey tax. Anything else that he did that would be considered a revolution or successful? The fact that the election was what? Giovanni? Uh, huh? So why might this rev uh, election be considered a revolution? Right, so ballot, not the bullet. Anything else that we can talk about? That we can talk about? Uh, Jalissa? Kept assumption. assumption, yeah, kept assumption. Anything else that can be considered political? Yeah, friend. Huh? Reduced army. He reduced the army. Anything else that he did that could be considered political? Any Supreme Court cases are considered political. Marbury v. Madison, definitely. Anything else? Hmm? The Louisiana Purchase, that can be considered political. Okay, let's go with economic then. Uh, Angie. Embargo Act. Embargo Act, sure. Embargo Act, definitely. Uh, Leslie. The bus. The bus. Eva. The, uh, the reduced military, sure. Uh, Adriana. The Louisiana, Purchase. Louisiana Purchase, sure. A Draven. Uh, repealed the whiskey tax, sure. Abel? The uh, kept the tariff. Anything else? Yeah, Brian? <coughs> oh, yeah. Uh, he was pro industrialization, I guess. Amanda? Yeah, I think that would be considered social. It can also be political and economic. Because the trade route, that could be economic. Trade relations, that's economic. Mapping, that's political. The fact that it happened could be social. Lewis and Clark. Anything else that could be considered economic? Nope. Let's move into social. Anything that happened socially that we want to talk about? Yeah, Laura. Huh? He is a president of moderation. Okay, we can talk about that. He was a president, understood both sides. Yes? Can you say that he pardoned the alien, the people dealing with Sure, the so maybe he pardoned the people in the Alien Sedition Act so that it helped the common people that were frustrated and upset. Adriana? The Judiciary The Judiciary Act was not something that he passed. Remember, it was passed by Adams. So remember, the Judiciary Act was not passed by Jefferson, it was passed by Adams. So what else? Abel? Huh? 
So uh, unity of parties, sure. Anything else that we can talk about socially for uh, Jefferson here? I mean, what kind of government did he try to create that could be considered social? Is the government for who? Government for common man. That's social. Anything else? OK, lastly, let's talk about international. So what's some international stuff that we can talk about under Jefferson? So yeah. Mosquito fleet, sure. Maria? Embargo Act, definitely. Uh, yeah, Marlon? Diplomacy. Huh? Diplomacy. What kind of diplomacy? No, he's like, he established that like, he wants to be friends with all the other countries. So peaceful diplomacy. Like, no alliances. What else? Uh, Eva. Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana Purchase. Stephanie. Huh? But what about international policy? Like specifically, what international policy can we write down? So the idea that peaceful diplomacy, definitely. I agree with that. The idea of peaceful diplomacy, no permanent alliances, I think that'll be good. Uh, Abel. Huh? Ah, so neutrality in Napoleonic War? Laura? You can say reduced army could be considered um, international, because that has to do with international stuff. Anything else that could be considered international? What about stuff that made us upset? The embargo is already up there, but uh, what about before that? Impressment. Impressment, yeah. Or the orders in council and the uh, continental system. So are there a lot of things that happened during Jefferson's administration? Yes. Most definitely. So the last thing I want you to do before we move on on our chart is I want you to spend two minutes. I want you to add an underline or highlight or just put an R with a circle next to all the things that you would consider to be revolutionary. So what happened during Jefferson's administration that was like a really important change? Whether it's social, economic, political, or international, what would be considered a major shift or change? I'll spend about two minutes doing this. So talk to a partner and go through your list real quick and identify what you think would be a major change or shift. in this election, and then we'll uh, highlight. So again, underline, discuss, whatever you need to.
Okay. So let's just identify the things that we would consider to be revolutionary. So let's go with, um, choose a few people here. Raul, what would you consider to be revolutionary? Uh, why would that be considered revolutionary? Okay, so you could say it's, it's a bad thing that was a change, but it's still a change nonetheless. So you can make that argument. Um, what else? Uh, Stephanie, what else could be considered a revolution? Revolution of 1800, definitely. That's pretty obvious there. I'm just going to highlight this in the interest of time, folks. Uh, we are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. That's a major change. Marbury versus Madison, that's a major change, as is judicial review. You're going to learn we're going to highlight most of this stuff. Um, but pragmatic, that's a big one. He kept the bank. Uh, the fact that he uh, had Mosquito Fleet, the election of 1800. Uh, the ballot versus the bullet, that's a pretty big deal. He reduced the army, that's a big deal. He kept the bank. Uh, Louisiana Purchase, sure. Kept the tariff, sure. Uh, he was a president of moderation, definitely. He wanted unity of the parties. He wanted government for the common man. He wanted peaceful diplomacy. Yeah. It's like that. But again, is a lot of this considered neutral? I mean, not, not neutral. Uh, is a lot of this considered revolutionary? Definitely. So it's just one of those things where even if it's all of it, do we have to identify and see that that is the case? Okay. So it is still important that even though you identify that, well, Mr. King, most of it is still revolutionary. Well, then good. I'm glad you see that. At least it's important to notice that that is the case. Okay. Good. Okay. Let's move on then. Let's finish off this section of unit three. So eventually, uh, Jefferson does step down, and uh, we have the next election of 1808. This is the next president. So Jefferson steps down, and in the, in the election of 1808, you have Republicans nominating James Madison and the Federalists nominating Charles Pinckney. Now, remember how Charles Pinckney ran against Madison, uh, Jefferson the last time? And he only won like 14 votes. So in this next election, where the Republicans nominate Madison and the Federalists nominate Pinckney, uh, again, you have this another Federalist versus Democrats election. Everyone ready? You guys complain like all you have to do is write in this class. No, it's because I messed up. No, that's exactly I, what you guys. No, no, it was a joke. It was a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> it's exactly what you guys do in this class. All you do is write in this class. It's exactly what you do. Which is good. No, nothing wrong with that. So, election of eighteen oh eight. Here are the results. Madison defeats Pinckney, one twenty two, to forty seven. But what do you start noticing about the votes again? Yeah, like, but it's st uh, still mostly Republicans voting. But in terms of regions, what's happening again with people that are voting? Who voted for Pinckney? Mostly which states? The New England states. So again, do you slowly start seeing the shift of the uh, Federalist Party again? You start seeing them being revived, and they were revived after what event? The Embargo Act. So now that they're angry, they have something to be angry about together again, and now they're going to start voting together. But what you'll recognize is that they're not really going to win an election yet. Good? No, the Federalists only had one president ever. Adams. Yeah. Uh, George Clinton was a Republican that was, not, was only nominated uh, by this part of New York here. Um, he did not win. He only got six votes, and he only got the six votes from this region. And he's only a minor candidate, so it doesn't matter. Because really, the vote was 122 to 47 to 6. So we don't even, it doesn't even matter. So, so yeah, Pinkney no. lost twice? Pinkney has lost twice already. So, 
Oh, sorry, Pinckney. So James Madison is president serving from 1808 to 1816, which means what do we know about him? Two-term president. Becoming our fourth president of the United States, the fourth POTUS. And there's already a lot of things we know about this guy. He was the father of the US Constitution. He was Secretary of State under Jefferson I and Vice President under Jefferson II. Jefferson Term II, not there's a second Jefferson. Uh, and he was also critical in the Marbury versus Madison case. So is he already a very important founding father? Yes, so just like Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, these four presidents in a row were just like really important people that kept on getting elected into office. So uh, all important stuff. Okay, so you know James Madison. Let's talk about what he did. What's the biggest problem that he's going to inherit from Jefferson? The Embargo Act. So what happens is in 1809, he passes the Non-Intercourse Act. And this is not an act that banned sex. Let's get that cleared up right now. <laughs> the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809 ended the Embargo Act. That's the first thing that we should note. So when James Madison became president, he passed the Non-Intercourse Act, which ended the Embargo Act. Good so far? Sure. And what it did was that it reopened trade with all of Europe, except who? England and France, because they're still attacking us. So it reopened trade with all of Europe except England and France. So here he is, killing the embargo. The dreaded, oh, grab me. So again, it ended the embargo, and it said that we would reopen trade with all of Europe except England and France. But by creating this law, folks, what did it pretty much admit on our part? That we were wrong. That we were wrong, and that what did we need? We needed Europe to trade. And so it proved that we were not a very strong country independently, and we did actually need Europe's trade. And so we had to admit that, unfortunately. But here's the problem, folks. Yes, we reopened trade with Europe, but who are our biggest trading partners? England and France. So even though we've reopened trade, have we gotten most of our trade back yet? Who are we going to trade with? Germany? Sweden, Norway, I mean, are these big countries that we traded with? No, and so are we still suffering because we have not reopened trade with our major allies, our trading partners? Sure, so we decide to pass what becomes known as Mason's Bill Number Two. And Mason's Bill Number Two was another attempt at reopening trade. And what Mason's Bill Number Two said was this. If either country stopped attacking American ships. So if either country stopped attacking American ships, the US would lift the embargo and only embargo their enemy. So if either country stopped attacking American ships, the US would lift its embargo and only embargo their enemy. So the US would lift its embargo and only embargo their enemy. So if France says, oh yeah, we'll stop attacking you, what's going to happen? We're going to embargo the British, and we'll trade with France. And if the British say, oh yeah, we'll stop attacking you, what's going to happen? We'll trade with the British and embargo the French. If they both agree, we resume free trade. So everybody wins. That's what we're hoping for. Everyone good so far? That's Mason's bill number two. Hopefully, uh, this is going to work out.
Who immediately took us up on our offer? France. Napoleon said, I'll do that. I will more than gladly take advantage of this offer. And so Napoleon agreed. And the reason why he agreed was what was he hoping to happen? We would embargo the British and hopefully that would lead to what? Not to victory. War between the British and the Americans. So Napoleon agreed. Here's what happened. Napoleon agreed. The US embargoes England. Is England happy about that? They are pissed. They are very angry at us. And so England responds by increasing impressment. So they do it even more. They're like, oh, okay. So you're gonna embargo us, but trade with our enemy. Well then fine, we're gonna step it up. And they began to impress more American ships. And are we as America happy about that? We're like, why don't you just accept the deal too? They're like, no. You took Napoleon's deal first, so we're coming after you, America. And we're gonna embark, we're gonna go ahead and impress all your ships. Any American ship that we see, we're coming after them. Are we as Americans happy about that? No. Problem number one. Okay? Keep that in the back of your heads. Problem number two. The Native Americans uh, are getting a bit rowdy. They're not happy with us because what have we been doing for the last, I don't know, 200 years? Taking oh, taking their land. Yeah, kind of a problem. And so Tecumseh and the Prophet, these are two Shawnee Indian brothers. By the way, the Prophet's real name was Tensquawada. You know, I'm going to name my daughter Tensquawada when I have a, I have a kid one day. Ten Squawada Tecumseh King. Good name. Anyway, so these Shawnee brothers, uh, they decide to create an Indian confederacy in the West. It's an alliance of Native Americans. That's what they're doing. Does that make sense to everyone so far? We're creating an Indian confederacy, which is an alliance of Native Americans. Now, my question is, and they're creating an Indian Confederacy, which is an alliance of Native Americans in the West. What are they going to try to do now that they form this alliance of Native Americans? They're going to try to get their land back. So the goal of the Indian Confederacy, led by Tecumseh and Tenskowada, was to stop American expansion and get their land back. So the goal of Tecumseh and the Prophet was to stop American expansion and get their land back. That was their goal. To stop American expansion and get their land back. So they start, back. They start attacking the American frontier. So they begin attacks on the American frontier. And who lives on the frontier, folks? Farmers do. So we, as farmers, live on the frontier. So that happens. That's not so good. Uh, so that's problem number two. The Native Americans are attacking us. One of the people that will stop them is this guy, William Henry Harrison. And he defeats them at the Battle of Tippecanoe. He defeats them at the Battle of Tippecanoe. He becomes a war hero because he defeated the Native Americans. His nickname is the Indian Fighter, and also his nickname is Tippecanoe because he defeated them. And because he becomes a war hero, likely that will help him become what? President, President of the United States one day. Hmm, interesting. Problem number two. Good? Problem number three. We believe that British Canadians are supplying the Native Americans with weapons. Number three is we believe that British Canadians are supplying them with weapons. So we're mad about that. Told you, never trust Canadians. All they're gonna do is supply Native Americans with guns and then they're gonna attack us. 
So this is going on. Everyone good? So we have three major problems. And so a group known as the Warhawks, which are young Republicans. So the Warhawks. Uh, the Warhawks were young Republicans that wanted to go to war with everybody. They declared war on the British. They declared war on the Native Americans. And they declared war on the Canadians. They said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with the British impressing us. I'm done with the Native Americans attacking us on the frontier, and I'm done with those devious Canadians supplying those attacks. We're done being pushed around. We're coming after all of you. So they declare war on everyone. And the leaders of the Warhawks at this time were Calhoun and Clay. They were the leaders of the Warhawks at this time. So we declare war. Everyone good so far? Mm -hmm. We declare war. So this brings us to the War of 1812. Here's a fun question to ask people. When did the War of 1812 start? No. And you're like, mm, 1762? No, 1812. But you'll be surprised. Yes, ma'am. Calhoun and Clay were the leaders of the Warhawks. Anyway, the War of 1812, a year, a war that lasted about three years. We'll talk about it in like two minutes. The key battle was the Battle of Washington, D.C. Not really that important, but here's the interesting part. The British burned down Washington, D.C. They burned it to the ground. And the interesting part was that Dolly Madison, James Madison's wife, uh, was in the White House preparing a dinner for a party they were about to have. But the British had arrived in Baltimore and they began to march on Washington and we didn't have that much notice. Like, oh my gosh, the British are here. So they had to like grab the most expensive things and they fled with like the re their first portrait of George Washington. And they took all the expensive art and they fled. And when the British showed up in DC, they went to the White House looking for the president and he was gone. But there was a dinner prepared. Like, oh, how nice. They made us dinner. So before they burned down the White House, they sat down and ate the meal that was prepared. And then when they were done eating, they got up and they burned the White House to the ground. <laughs> now, they did literally burn the White House to the ground. And the new White House there was built right on top of it. So if you ever get a chance to go to the White House, which you can't today because of the government shutdown, but if you ever do get to go to the White House, uh, in the Oval Office, there's a railing that was part of the original White House. And there's still burn marks on it. So you get an idea of like, that was burnt in the original shutdown of the White House, or the original burning of it down. Here's the other cool part. The British had burned down all of DC and it was on fire. It was like a firestorm and the British were just there. Luckily, a tornado occurred right in the heart of Washington DC. The only tornado ever recorded in this region. It begins and the gale winds start blowing and it blows out all the fires and it destroys about a third of the British army. So yeah, uh, that happened, where a freak tornado shows up in the heart of DC, never to be seen from again, the day that DC is on fire and the British have invaded. So I'm not a religious man, but if I was, I would assume that God again has intervened on behalf of the United States. Seems to be something that he does a lot. Another key battle is the Battle of New Orleans. What was the other war that the Congress... Battle of Long Island? With the fog? Yeah, 
Yes, this is exactly the other one. One third, not three fourths, that's a lot. One third of the British Army was killed in that tornado. Next up is the Battle of New Orleans. And in the Battle of New Orleans, this is also part of the War of 1812. In the Battle of New Orleans, General Andrew Jackson defeats the British. And this is considered pretty awesome because you have 8,000 British versus 7,000 Americans. You have 8,000 British versus 7,000 Americans. General Andrew Jackson defeats the British. And the reason why this was so amazing is because his 7,000 Americans defeated 8,000 British. Now, you might think to yourself, well, Mr. King, those numbers are very similar. Yeah, but 2,000 British were killed while only seven Americans were killed. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that happened. 2,000 British soldiers were killed and only 70 Americans were killed in the Battle of New Orleans. 70 or 7? 70. So we, do we feel pretty good about ourselves? We're like, yeah, we did that. Suck on that. Britain, we defeated you pretty, pretty badly. 2,000 deaths versus 70. Now here's the horrible part about all of this. We defeated them. This is uh, January 1814 when this battle happened. Uh, and he's known as a war hero as a result of this, guys. He's known as a war hero. But just the messed up part, folks. is that the war ended a month earlier. The treaty was signed in December 1814, and then so he got the letter and he's like, oh, oh we just killed 2,000 people, and the war was over, and that's terrible. Oh well, folks, have a wonderful day. Complete your homework if you didn't finish it. I'll see you guys later.